Back in uh, 2005, I was practicing general pediatrics in Springfield, Ohio, and I ran into a couple of uh, real frustrations. The first was that uh, it was a busy practice in an underserved area, and I just didn't have enough time to spend with my patients. Uh, parents have a lot of questions. There's a lot of bullet points that you try to get through, especially in well checkups. And there's just not, a time to cover, not enough time to cover everything um, or to answer parents' questions like you want to. The second frustration was the internet. Uh, parents have a lot of questions, and they go online looking for answers to those questions. And they were reading things like MMR causes autism, that uh, fluoride in the water is dangerous, that fever causes brain damage. And so I found that the very short amount of time I had during these office visits was often spent uh, stamping out little fires of misinformation that they were bringing uh, from the internet into the exam room. So I started thinking, uh, is there a way that I could lend my voice uh, to the digital conversation? And if I could, uh, that could accomplish a couple of things. First, I could have a repository of more detailed information. So in the exam room, I could say, here's the quick answer to your question. But if you want to know more about the science of this, you want to know uh, about different, uh, different uh, things that we could do to treat it, what are the benefits and the risks of, of different ways to go, uh, you could go into side conversations and talk about antibiotic stewardship, for example. You could really go into a lot more detail, uh, not necessarily dumb down the science, explain it in terms that they can understand, but spend more time doing it. The second thing that that might accomplish is uh, maybe there would be parents out there who would come across this repository of information and uh, it would be evidence-based, something trustworthy rather than all of the misinformation that was out there. And uh, back in 2005, there weren't a lot of options for that uh, in terms of where you could direct patients to get a good source of information. So as I thought about uh, what form such a repository of information could take, uh, podcasting came to mind. And to understand uh, why I became interested in podcasting, you have to go back about 40 years ago to the late 1970s and uh, this version of myself. I was a, uh, <laughs> that's how I felt when I uh, saw the picture uh, many years later. But uh, I was a competitive roller skater uh, as a 10-year-old boy, spent a lot of time in the skating rink, and uh, if you spent much time in the skating rink in the late 70s to early 80s, uh, it seemed, at least from my perspective, that the coolest job in the world uh, was that of the disc jockey. Uh, because you got to pick the music, you got to play with technology. It just seemed like a lot of fun. And so my life's ambition as a 10-year-old was to someday be a DJ. Well, I didn't have to wait long because, as fate would have it, uh, one day the disc jockey who was scheduled called in sick, very short notice, and the management of the skating rink, which happened to be my mom, uh, had, to, <laughs> had to scramble to find a disc jockey. And she said, hey, do, would you be willing to give this a try? Yeah, absolutely. And so that began uh, a weekly gig of doing Saturday morning kids fun skates at the local skating rink. In middle school, I went on to uh, do the afternoon uh, sessions. And, the, and in high school, I did Friday and Saturday evenings and the all night skates. And this was a time when hundreds of people would come to the skating rink on the weekends. Uh, I went on to college and got involved in radio. I worked at a couple different radio stations uh, during the college years, and then went to medical school and really forgot about DJing and broadcasting until this idea of podcasts came out and I was having these frustrations in the office. And so I started thinking, uh, what would a pediatric podcast look like? Would, would parents listen to that? I, I started listening to podcasts and podcasts about how to make podcasts. And in uh, July of uh, 2006, I launched PediaCast, it's our original logo, as a, a pediatric podcast for parents. Uh, something where we could cover pediatric news, which really meant taking a journal article, uh, explaining the science in terms parents could understand, looking at the strength of the evidence, and hopefully putting a little practical spin on it that families could use. Uh, we could answer listener questions, uh, interview pediatric experts through uh, Skype, and I did this from a home studio in the basement of my house. 
But I wondered, uh, would anyone really listen? I mean, maybe a handful of my patients uh, would enjoy it, but beyond that, would I really get very many listeners? Uh, well, as it turns out, uh, a lot of people listened. And within a few months, I got an email from my uh, web host where I had all the files for the podcast. And they said, you have 24 hours to get your stuff off of our machine because you're breaking it. There's too many downloads. So I had to scramble and uh, come up with a solution that would have unlimited bandwidth, meaning uh, as many people as wanted could all download it at the same time. Uh, but back then, that was a pretty expensive proposition. And so I thought, uh, who could be my bandwidth sponsor? And really, uh, the, the only place that came to mind was Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, I, had, uh, I had trained here. My practice was not too far away down the road. I still had connections with the hospital. And so I pitched this idea of Nationwide Children's being my bandwidth sponsor. Well, as it turns out, they were really looking to get into the digital space as well and to be an online source of information that was trustworthy and evidence-based that parents who were searching for answers uh, could come across and really get some help for their family. And so we partnered up. Uh, it was a win-win situation. We've been uh, partners now for 11 years in producing PediaCast. Uh, you can find it at PediaCast.org, but really wherever you find podcasts, you'll find it. Uh, we're in iTunes, uh, Google Play, iHeartRadio, mobile podcasting apps for iOS and Android. And over these 11 years, uh, we have produced 379 episodes. We've had millions of downloads and uh, listeners in all 50 US states and over 200 countries. Now, as you think about these numbers, these folks are not coming to listen to an old skating rink disc jockey. Uh, they're coming because they care about their kids and they're looking for answers to questions. There's answers out there, uh, but a lot of it is junk. Uh, there's misinformation, there's medical myths, and they're just they're trying to find a place where they can get answers from a trustworthy source that's evidence-based, and that should be encouraging uh, to all of us. Now, uh, I've had an upgrade in uh, studios. It's not in the basement of my house anymore. We uh, actually have a audio studio here on campus. Uh, I've been here doing that now since 2011. And this is great because uh, our experts here at, PD at uh, Nationwide Children's can stop by the studio and uh, be interviewed on the podcast, share their expertise with the audience, and they can do it uh, between uh, their clinics, over the lunch hour. I've had folks come in before their OR schedule, uh, between committee meetings that they have. And so it's a really convenient place for them to stop by and be on the show. Uh, we also have a mobile studio. We went to the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, National Conference in San Francisco this past um, October, and we were re able to record some podcasts from the floor of the exhibition hall. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, two years ago, we began a sibling podcast for uh, providers uh, that offers uh, Category 1 uh, continuing medical education credit. Uh, it's available in all the same places that you find uh, PediaCast, and it's absolutely free. Anyone can listen to it, easy to find. And in two years, uh, we've produced 26 episodes. Uh, it's a smaller target audience, but we've had over 100,000 downloads, national, international audience, and we've uh, had uh, uh, 2,000 hours of claimed Category 1 CME so far uh, from this program. Now, I am not uh, the only physician at Nationwide Children's who is interested in creating digital content that parents can use uh, to learn about the health and well-being of, of their kids. And podcasting is not uh, the only form of digital content that one can create. Uh, Dr. Jamie Macklin is a pediatric hospitalist, and uh, she is interested in decreasing infant mortality by educating parents about safe baby sleep. She wrote a blog post uh, on the ABCs of safe sleep, that babies ought to sleep alone on their back and in a crib. And in doing so, uh, she uh, had 925 page views, so 925 families that she was able to educate. Now, that's not uh, thousands of people that she's engaging. It's less than 1,000. But I want to put that number into perspective for you. It would take Dr. Macklin six weeks of practicing clinical medicine day in and day out to impact that same number of families. She also participated in a podcast where we talked about safe sleep. Uh, this time she had 4,500 
families that she connected with with this information, it would take her seven months of clinical practice to reach that, that number of uh, folks. So it really can have quite, quite a wide reach. Now maybe uh, you're not a clinician, maybe you're a researcher, and you want to know, is this something that uh, could benefit me, getting the word out about the research I'm doing? Uh, Dr. Mejias is working on an RSV vaccine, so she wrote a blog post. She really wanted to get awareness out there about her uh, vaccine and uh, the development of it. But you'll notice that in this blog post where she's talking to parents, uh, she really met the need of the parent, which is just to know what is RSV, what causes it, what are the symptoms, uh, how do you treat it, how do you prevent it. And in the, con in the context of giving them what they needed to hear, she was able to say, hey, I'm also working on a vaccine uh, just to raise awareness about it. So her goal of raising awareness uh, and the needs of the audience were kind of aligned there. And that's an important, uh, important point when we engage any audience, whether it's in a live forum uh, or in the digital space. Uh, she went on to participate in a CME podcast. Now, of course, she's going to talk more details about her vaccine research because she's speaking to her colleagues. And uh, she had 8,500 listeners for this particular episode. Now, I don't know of any conference where Dr. Mejias could go and present her vaccine research to that many colleagues, but she was able to do it by spending an hour in the podcast studio. Maybe uh, you're not a clinician or a researcher. Maybe big ideas that affect families and uh, communities are more of your interest. Things like quality, safety, and health literacy. Uh, Dr. Marianne Abrams uh, is interested in health literacy. She wrote a blog post that really just focused on how can you best prepare for a visit to the doctor's office? What kind of questions should you ask your doctor? How can you be the best advocate for your child? And uh, to give parents permission to say, hey, I don't understand what you're saying to me. Please take a step back and explain it better. So she wrote that in her blog post, and she reached uh, 250 families with this message. Now, you may be saying, OK, we can tolerate a little less than 1,000, but is it really worthwhile uh, to spend a couple hours writing a blog post if I'm only going to reach 250 families? But I want to remind you that in the course of clinical practice, we take care of patients one family at a time in the exam room. And absolutely, it is worth a couple hours writing a blog post if you can make a significant difference in the lives of 250 families. That's significant. Uh, now, also, when you have a small audience, it is okay to take a step back and say, is there a different way that I could present my information, maybe to a different target audience? And so uh, Dr. Abrams participated in a podcast for uh, parents and reached 4,000 families with her health literacy message and a CME podcast on health literacy, introducing these concepts to our colleagues. How can you uh, really help your patients and families achieve better health literacy? And she was able to reach 6,500 uh, pediatric providers in the course of participating in this uh, podcast. So what about you? Are you interested in creating digital content to really be the counter narrative to all the misinformation that's present on the internet? I know many of you are, because we have had conversations about it. And uh, some of the questions I get asked are, well, where do you start? You know, what topic should I, should I present? How do, you, how do you do this? And I always say you should start with what you're passionate about. You know, what are you talking about day in and day out in the exam room? Uh, what does your research uh, focus on? What manuscripts are you writing or grant proposals? What com committee meetings do you go to that you really get excited about going? I mean, what fires you up? Those are the things that you should uh, present because you are the content expert. So don't let someone out there pretend they're the expert when it's really you. And then you want to call upon your talents and your resources. So I look back to the days as a skating rink disc jockey to get involved in podcasting. But maybe you're an artist and could design an infographic that explains what you're passionate about and then share that on social media. Maybe you're a writer and blog, blogging and writing posts really are an interest for you and you'd love doing that. Or maybe you're a tech geek like myself and uh, you're more interested in how do you put a podcast together? What kind of equipment do you need? Um, what are best practices for um, promoting that podcast? Or uh, how can you be a um, guest of a podcast? And, uh, 
uh, think about, about that if you're interested, because there are three billion podcasts that get downloaded every year, and so your target audience of who you want to reach, certainly there are folks uh, listening. And then think about your resources, and you actually have some great resources here at Nationwide Children's. Uh, our 700 Children's blog, um, the, some of the posts have had over 100,000 page views. Uh, some of our podcast episodes have had 70,000 listeners in a single episode. Uh, so, and all of you are more than welcome uh, to participate in those things. And then one other uh, resource that I want to leave you with is actually a podcast series about how to do this. Uh, it is a 12-episode series. Um, you don't have to listen to the whole thing. You can pick and choose. You don't even have to listen to them in order. Uh, and they cover things like how do you come up with a topic and your goals and the needs of your audience and aligning those things in a creative way. Uh, one episode is just best practices for Facebook. Uh, another best practices for Twitter. How do you write a blog post? How many words ought to be? Do you do bullet points? Uh, what's the most efficient way to get your message across? A whole episode just deals with that. Uh, another is focused on uh, podcasts. What equipment do you need? How do you put it together? How do you get on other people's shows? And you can find this uh, series at pdacastcme.org. Uh, and then there will be some tabs up at the top. And HCSM stands for Healthcare Communications and Social Media. Just click on that tab, and the podcasts uh, will come down for you. But they're also freely available in iTunes and Google Play. In fact, if you just Google PediaCast and Communications, you'll find these podcasts. So I hope that you will uh, consider joining us in uh, creating digital content and really helping to stamp out all that misinformation that's out there uh, on the internet. Because uh, the more folks that we have participating in doing this, the more likely it is that an individual family is going to come across trustworthy, evidence-based information rather than uh, the junk. And in that way, we really can make a far-reaching difference in the lives of, uh, of children, families, and communities. Thank you.